Hi, I'm Elena Fragamini. Welcome to The Transcript. This week, in light of changing regulations, trends, and behaviors regarding drugs in America, The Transcript is bringing you an episode themed around drugs. We'll examine the historical war on drugs, vaping at Northampton High, new marijuana regulations, impacts of the opioid epidemic, and how the prevalence of sports-enhancing drugs are affecting young athletes. The New York Times reported on Tuesday that North Korea has been shipping supplies to the Syrian government that could be used to create chemical weapons. This revelation comes as government strikes continued in the eastern Gota region of Syria. Doctors say that over 500 people have died in the area in the past nine days, when the Syrian government intensified the strikes. Fighting has continued even in scheduled ceasefire periods, making it impossible for humanitarian aid to enter the region where food and supplies are scarce. In the weeks since the mass shooting in Parkland, Florida, a nationwide conversation about gun control has arisen. This week, both Walmart and Dick's Sporting Goods announced that they would stop selling guns and ammunition to anyone under the age of 21. Dick's Sporting Goods also announced that they would no longer sell assault-style rifles. On Wednesday, President Trump held a televised meeting in which he voiced support for increased background checks, banning bump stocks, and arming teachers. On Tuesday, the Supreme Court reversed a previous ruling by a California Court of Appeals that said detained immigrants have a right to a bail hearing after six months. The 5-3 to three ruling could lead to immigrants being jailed without bail indefinitely as they await deportation. While the ruling struck down the California law that demanded a bail hearing, the constitutional question of whether or not detained immigrants have a right to a hearing will head back to the California courts to be debated in coming months. Hi, I'm Odette Bennis, and welcome back to Hit It or Miss It, where all things pop culture are covered. This week, the transcript is covering many facts of new drug regulation. There's a deeper history behind these issues, one that begins in the 1970s with the war on drugs. The war on drugs is an American term used to describe the federal government's campaign about the prohibition of drugs, military aid, and military intervention. In June of 1971, the Nixon administration dramatically increased the size and presence of federal drug control agencies, meaning harsher laws were passed and people were charged with nonviolent and violent drug offenses. To get a brief history on the war on drugs, we sat down with NHS history teacher Ray Hart. Uh, the war on drugs is an attempt to try and curb behavior. We're, it's no longer just getting drugs out of the hands of those folks. It's also now criminalizing the behavior and turning the people who use into public menaces, into, into uh, people who are like whole cultures that are, that are that, that revolve around, around criminal behavior. And it, and it heightens the sense of, of, of uh, fear that we might have for those groups, and particularly the racial basis. I think historically, sociologically, uh, blacks in American cities became overrun by the war on, on drugs. To get a sense how this history impacts current drug cases in our nation and state, I sat down with Miles Jacobson, an attorney and professor of public health at UMass Amherst. People of, co of color are more disadvantaged economically. Uh, most studies, a lot of studies show that economic disadvantage leads to more likely criminal activity. So it's more likely that from a young age there are going to be people of color rather than that same other person who's not a person of color is going to have gotten involved with the criminal justice system in some way or another from an early age. Rather than having treatment options, they've had juvenile crime options. Now sometimes those are helpful to people, but often they just set the ball rolling. They just start to pile up in terms of convictions or in terms of attitudes towards that person. So by the time they get to court as an adult, and they're like five years into an adulthood, and, but they have two crimes on their record already, they want to get out on bail, they're less likely to get out on bail if they've ever done anything in the past. They're, they're le and they're also less likely to have resources to put out to show, to prove to the court that they're going to 
be able to return when they're supposed to return. The effects from the war on drugs have been very detrimental to families nationally and locally. Think of how you can help your fellow peers and their families. I'm Odette Benes, and this was Hit It or Miss It. Howdy, I'm Mikey Diaz. Late last week, the North American Soccer League announced they were canceling the entire 2018 season after... Wrong segment! Oh, thanks. Welcome to the transcript. If you've ever gone to the bathroom at NHS, you've probably interacted with someone vaping. Juul is a vaporizer that was intended to be an alternative to smokers so users would inhale all the tar and smoke from regular cigarettes. Juuls operate with removable pods that contain tobacco. Use is discreet and doesn't leave a significant cigarette smell. Vaping using Juuls, or Juuling, in NHS has become extremely popular as of late. Many students have reported seeing their classmates vaping classes, hallways, and most infamously, the bathrooms. In fact, just today, approximately 10 students were busted in a third floor bathroom after being caught for vaping. I took the halls at NHS to ask students about their experiences with the rising prevalence of vaping at Northampton High School. It's mostly during passing periods or when kids are in the bathroom, but every once in a while you'll get one or, one or two of those kids that'll jewel in the middle of class and it's a little bit distracting. Do you think the administration is doing enough in preventing jeweling during the school? I mean, I don't think there's much they really can do. Like, they're kind of just like low-key, like it's hard to tell if kids have them and stuff. However, this phenomenon isn't isolated to just NHS. A recent CBS News report detailed jeweling spreading through middle and high schools nationwide. How prevalent do I think vaping is for our school community? Um, I think it's pretty significant. You know, we're, we're aware of it through, this, through um, things that we hear from custodians, teachers, and students that, that it's out there. Um, and we are finding instances of, having, of students having that in their possession or instances of smoking in the, in the bathroom. The only law that they're breaking is the people who sell it to them. Um, however, school policy is something much different than law. So here in the school, you are not allowed to even possess them. I'm Mikey Diaz. Thanks for watching. I'll see you next week on The Transcript. I'm Ashley Ginsberg, and this week we're talking legal marijuana, or really, the aftermath of the decision on Northampton businesses. On November 8, 2016, the state of Massachusetts voted to legalize marijuana for recreational sale and use for persons over the age of 21. But how has legal cannabis affected businesses in town that sell paraphernalia? This week, we sit down with grow house owner Daniel Smith to discuss the effects of legal cannabis on grow house and how these new changes in regulation will affect his business. Um, we actually wanted to open a smoke shop in Northampton because of the laws. I think you guys voted 72% in favor of question four. The, the legalization definitely opened loopholes for certain stores to take advantage of. Um, not, us, not our store, but some stores have tried to beat the system, you know, mm -hmm. and sell things they shouldn't be, but um, those stores were closed down pretty quick, and I don't think anyone else has tried, but we should just really wait for the actual stores to start popping up. And the medical dispensaries have first rights over the, um, the licenses, so I, I believe that NETA should um, become a recreational dispensary. There's obviously changes of leadership on the federal level. Uh, mm. Do you think that's going to affect the way Massachusetts is operating in terms of legal cannabis? A few of the dispensaries have had some problems with um, being tested and having them fail the tests and things like that. Hopefully with the new laws, new changes of leadership, they should be able to work on those a little bit. Make it, uh, make it so the dispensaries have to work a little bit harder to stay, stay on their A-game. It can be difficult to navigate the law, especially in the case of cannabis. To help understand and make sense of this topic, we also sit down with Professor Julie Steiner, cannabis law professor at Western New England University, and my mom. So how is it possible that cannabis can be illegal on the federal level, but legal on a Massachusetts state level? Because of the supremacy clause, when states legalize this Controlled Substance Act still stands atop of it and preempts conflicting state laws. So all the laws that you hear about at the state level are technically illegal. In the federal eyes, if banks um, were to take money, then they could be accused of money laundering. They could be shut down, they could be prosecuted, they can have their assets seized. So how have they been operating? Have they been operating in cash in a lot they, of these places? Yes, these entities, because of that, have essentially been acting as all cash entities, which is not desirable. I mean, I think what we're all, tr what the goal of this is, is to bring things to the transparent front 
um, to make sure that they're regulated properly and operating with large sums of cash is frankly dangerous. Like anything this complex, it's not going to be perfect. Um, but hopefully Massachusetts is going to be a state where we try to catch things as they as we go forward and correct them in as short a span as possible. And from what I see, I'm encouraged that we have the, the right people in place to do that. Hi, I'm Flor Castillo, and this is Tell It Like It Is. In recent years, the opioid epidemic has been impacting our communities. And overall, in the United States, more than 64,000 Americans have died from drug overdose in 2016. According to the American Society of Addiction Medicine, about 2 million people in the U.S. are addicted to opioids, a term which describes medications often prescribed for pain relief, a number in the case of at least another half million Americans being addicted to heroin. I sat down with Cherry Sullivan, coordinator of the Hampshire Hope, which works on opioid prevention and education to get a better sense of how this epidemic is impacting our community. So in public health, we think about the impact on individuals, on families, on the community, and then on bigger systems. In our broader community, we have a workforce that uh, is impacted by this. There are employees. We know our healthcare systems. It really does impact all ages, but we do see that people who are 18 to 44 seem to be dying more often than other ages. We know young people are impacted by opioid use disorder and addiction. In Hampshire County, a few years ago, we had a rate of about four, a little over 4% of high school students misusing prescription opioids. And over the past couple of years, we've done really great work in the schools, and that's dropped down to less than 1%. It often falls to the police department to respond to opioid use and overdose. To find out what role the police department is playing on opioid prevention efforts, I sat down with Chief Police Jody Casper. Certainly, you know, when we encounter people struggling with drug addiction, um, there's a lot more recognition of it as, as, a, as a health problem. Um, as an addiction, trying to get people connected to resources. So all of our officers kind of recognize that and see it that way. But then in addition, we started the, the DART team. DART team is the drug addiction response team. And these are officers who recognize that, you know what, heroin and op opioid, this is a crisis. And we need to do something more. And instead of, you know, waiting for people to overdose and die or waiting till we have to arrest them for something, let's find people who we know are struggling with addiction go out there and say, hey, we're worried about you. Here's some resources. I'll drive you there. I'll check in with you all the time. And that's what these officers are doing. On Wednesday, February 21st, Mayor Narkowicz announced that the city of Northampton will be part of a national lawsuit against pharmaceutical manufacturers and distributors for their role in the creation of the opioid epidemic. Northampton will be joining towns like Greenfield, East Hampton, and more across the state. They have agreed to take part in the lawsuit. In the meantime, organizations like Hampshire Hope and the police department will continue working on community actions to keep preventing the rise of more opioid incidents. I'm Flor Castillo, and this was Tell It Like It Is. Hi, I'm Lulu. Welcome to Hamped Up. Y'all ready for this? Since the early 1900s, performance-enhancing drugs have been used by professional, college, and youth athletes. Steroids can give athletes an unsafe but quicker way to gain muscle and improve their overall performance. Despite negative side effects, steroids and other performance-enhancing drugs are still being used by all types of athletes, creating a false perspective on muscle enhancement and proper performance improvement. Many popular professional athletes have been exposed for using steroids as well, such as Major League Baseball player Alex Rodriguez, cyclist Lance Armstrong, and the Russian athletes who were banned from this year's Winter Olympics due to the doping scandal. But what effect might this have on student athletes hoping to enter the college or professional level in their sport? I sat down with Strides Athletic Trainer Jeremy Dillon to learn more. It seems to me that for teenagers, um, mainly high school athletes, like they're mainly using it to get bigger and be more competitive, which is why most people use it. However, if you have a professional athlete, you know, they're mainly using it for recovery so that they can stay playing and stay on the field so that they're getting their paycheck. You know what I mean? As a professional athlete, that's their job. I think that we can promote hard work and 
accepting and working through challenges because people often look for the easy way out. They don't want to put in the hard work that it takes and the lifestyle changes. However, there are some very short term things that we can change that will do that. But then long term success in strength and speed and mobility and overall feeling good about yourself, not just your performance, but also mentally and how you, and your self-esteem. Um, that comes with long-term training. Because of their prevalence in athletic communities, wellness teachers and athletic coaches have begun teaching their students about performance-enhancing drugs. I sat down with NHS wellness teacher and coach Salem Derby to learn more. As a teacher here at NHS, I do address uh, performance enhancing drugs in my wellness class and in my PE class and really looking at what are the actual benefits versus hazards to taking performance enhancing drugs. They are not necessarily the, the danger that a lot of people think they are but they need to be used under medical supervision. But it kind of seems like that's not something students are actively looking for. I think what they're looking for is legal ways like creatine or other, you know, pre-workout or things like that that can give them a little bit of an edge when they work out. As athletic events continue to grow in popularity, the issue of performance enhancing drugs will continue to be a concern for health and ethics of competition. The boys ice hockey team has a semi-final playoff game this Saturday at 1.30 in West Springfield. There are no other sporting events this week, but both boys and girls basketball teams are the number one seed in their division and will play in a semi-final game next week. Dates and times to be announced. Thanks for watching Hamped Up. I'm Lulu Kesson. Thanks for watching. If you want to learn more about any of the topics covered in this week's episode, check out the Northampton Prevention's Coalition Facebook page or reach out to Coalition Coordinator Ananda Lennox. All right, fellas, how we doing? We making the big bucks over here? We got our donation pages up. Pretty good. What are we at? $25. Ooh, 25 already. First day. Let's go. You raised 25 Oh, my God. You just, like, I don't know when we make this. An hour ago? Yeah. That's awesome. Did you, did you raise anything yet? No, not yet. Here. Oh, oh. all right. Well, I mean, you know, it's not a competition or anything. Yeah, you know, no. we're just, you know, doing good for the community. Cool. Um, how did you get that? That's awesome, dude. Wait, hey, that's from Jeremy Whalen. Shut up, wow, bro. Wow, that guy's probably okay. really generous and handsome too. But don't, don't worry about it, man. Don't hate. Stop being a hater, okay? We don't need that haterade around here.